All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'm back. I was gone for a couple of weeks. Uh, anything that I say is definitely not meant to diagnose or replace your medical care. Check with your doctor before implementing any of the things we're going to talk about. There's a lot of things we're going to talk about. So, hey, Steve. Hey, good morning. How's going? Welcome back. We've all missed you, Dr. Berg, and are very excited to find out what sort of research you did in the field, or I don't know if you're in Vegas for a couple of weeks, whatever, but we'd love to hear from you to see what your progress was and if you discovered anything new for us to ingest. So if you don't mind, Dr. Berg, take it away and catch us up on the last three weeks or so. Yeah, the food in Vegas was great, uh, and I'm being very sarcastic at the all-you-can-eat buffet. Now, it's, um, I went to um, Europe because I wanted to find out, um, you know, you go to Europe and if you compare Europe to America, uh, as far as the foods go, there's a slight difference, right? Uh, people go there and they, from America, and they're like, wow, I, have, I don't have digestive issues. I'm not gaining weight. Um, food's definitely higher quality for sure. So I wanted to find out why. So I visited, we visited probably about 20 farms and um, went through and, learned so much and it was fascinating because it really the the quality of food comes from the soil and the quality of soil and unfortunately um you know we don't emphasize that enough so i'm going to be doing a uh, a whole presentation on that coming up soon so i'll share what i found but fascinating amazing stuff with uh, the farming techniques and how they make their soil so fertile and how they grow certain things so um, it's very, very exciting. And I'm just extremely interested in it because you can't, your health comes from, um, you know, healthy animals that graze on healthy plants that come from healthy soils. So you got to really talk about the soil, learn about that to really get you healthy. I mean, I don't think this is just my theory that you can eat, um, sick plants, empty plants, sick animals and get healthy. I think, I don't think you can, I might be wrong, but I think the healthier the animal, the plant, the healthier you're going to be. Just my theory. Well, it certainly uh, holds water. Uh, and um, so, on the other hand, Hostess Twinkies last for a thousand years. So, maybe there's some trade-off there. Yeah, it definitely will preserve you like an embalming agent. But other than that, <laughs> I, I don't know if it gets you healthy. That's great. Well, we can't hear, uh, wait to see all the videos and so on that come out as a result of that. And I tell you what, we have some uh, great folks online, but one is coming to us from a recent move to the Philippines, and it's late at night. So we are going to go ahead with uh, Mr. McKay from the Philippines. And Mr. McKay, you're on with Dr. Berg. Oh, unmute yourself, sir. Uh, uh, trying to get my mic un unmuted yeah. there. There you go. Uh, hey, Dr. Berg. Um, Awesome that I get a chance to talk to you. I want to make this question quick because I know everybody wants to ask you questions. But um, I've actually done a 60-day um, juice fast before. So I'm kind of um, extreme on losing weight different ways. And I was looking at people that have talked about doing boiled eggs and just doing a boiled egg diet um, and doing it for a couple of weeks. I was thinking about doing it for a month just to see if I could lose um, X, X amount of pounds. And I wanted to see your uh, opinion about it. If I wanted to do intermittent fasting and just eat boiled eggs for a month, um, I know that uh, you're pretty adamant on eating eggs. Um, I think that you talk about not as much boiling them, probably eating them over easy. So the yolks, um, from what I remember from your videos, that they would be more nutritious. But I'm just curious... What, what would you say if I was to do a 30-day um, egg diet where I just did intermittent uh, and I chose to eat once a day and I chose to eat boiled eggs or, or um, eggs over easy and nothing else for a quick weight loss, what, um, what, what would you think about that? Is that a, a scare? Well, I, mean, I think out of all the things, out of all the things you could eat, that probably would be the best thing to eat if you were going to do that for sure because it. The egg has so many nutrients, especially if you're going to get some eggs from a farm that you know, you know, allowed them to free range. And, or if you did get them from the store, they have to be pasture raised and uh, um, organic. Uh, I think, I think that would be, um, I think that would be, you'd be successful. You may want to um, also, in addition to that, take certain things like, for example, 
uh, a natural vitamin C, not ascorbic acid, but a natural vitamin C, maybe some more omega-3 fatty acids, just to make sure you're not deficient in anything because you're going to be getting the protein, which is eggs are the best source of protein, so that's good. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get any atrophy. Um, maybe some trace minerals and uh, um, maybe um, you're probably going to need vitamin D. Um, but I think that might might be successful. Just watch for any type of problems you run into, like um, deficiency problems, because that's a long time to fast, which I, I think it's great. And the, the benefits are going to be off the chart. But let's say, for example, you do this and you feel weaker or you have some other symptoms like you're you know, just make sure you're taking all the other nutrients to prevent that. But, you know, it's not a bad idea. And I think um, out of all the foods, that would be probably more of the complete nutrient profile foods that you could eat. Okay. Well, yeah, I just wanted to get your opinion on that. Well, that's great. Um, like game. Yeah. yeah. And Thank over, you. over easy, over easy would be the, see the egg yolk, right? If the egg yolk is uh, runny, it's raw, which you want to do. Now you might say, well, doesn't there, isn't there bacteria in there? No, because there's no way bacteria could penetrate the shell and the white part to get to the yellow part. It's not going to happen. So um, the only thing, um, if you, as long as you cook the white part, you know, you're good. And then keep the inside fairly runny. And then you're, you got a great product there. So uh, try it out and let us know how, how you do. And um, I like the concept. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, we really yeah, would love to. It's about 40 pounds. Good. What a great goal. So, okay. yeah. You let can us do that for sure. Come yeah. back on the air with us in 30 days or whatever, Mr. McKay, and, and let us know how it went. I imagine that he, being in the Philippines, could probably uh, find some pretty uh, good sources for eggs and so on. And why don't we kick off your month hiatus with the first quiz question of the day, and here it is. All right, so what is um, the most common nutrient deficiency that keeps you tired, keeps you exhausted, keeps you um, without energy? That's the first question. Um, so let's see how many of you guys know that answer. Um, yeah, that's right. That's the first question. Very good. How about our first question from YouTube? Uh, this is Joy, wants to know what causes pain or tingling under the left rib cage. Mm, interesting. Um, I have no idea other than maybe a possible version of um, shingles, possibly. Because um, that's the, these, those nerve uh, run right through the ribs to there. That could be uh, maybe a mild, mild version on that. I mean, that's a long shot, but I mean, I was, I thought you were going to say underneath your feet, but underneath the rib cage. Um, now, if it's, if there's something going on deeper, you know, you think gallbladder, uh, I think pancreas, you know, pancreas, uh, and that usually happens from the wrong type of foods that you're eating. But typically, um, if it's superficial, it sounds more like a um, potential shingles type outbreak. And I have a lot of videos on what to do about that. Vitamin D, very, very important. Very good. Well, hope that's the extent of it. Shingles is a bad deal for, for many. Okay, let's see. Karen from YouTube. I've been doing keto and IF since March and have lost 58 pounds. All right, that calls to the bell. Congratulations on that. I've also been diagnosed with, uh, oh, goodness, uh, Bullis uh, Pemphigold, P-E-M-P-H-I-G-O-L-D. Uh, blistering to the skin, apparently, is what that. How can I get rid of this autoimmune issue? I've never heard of it. Bullus pimpagode, if I said that right. Pimpagold. Uh, I've never heard of it either. Uh, but if we're dealing with autoimmune, we're dealing with a, a weakened immune system. And I, I think right off the bat, the, the best thing you could do for any autoimmune would be to, and especially for the skin, it is vitamin D, D3. I have high quantities. Uh, like I'm talking 30,000, maybe 40,000 IUs. Um, that would be very important. And then, um, the other thing too, is I, I'd go back to your diet. Like, is there anything that you're eating, um, that could be affecting the gut because there's a huge relationship between the gut and your skin. And usually skin problems are related to something you're eating that maybe you shouldn't be eating. So I always go back to that, uh, you know, the basics, the obvious thing first, I'll give you just another example 
of another possibility. Um, there was a person who I recently talked to, very fairly young in their thirties, and they had a lot of a lot of you know fatigue. They don't feel right, and come to find out, she's on uh, eight medications. Anyone with that many poisons, I'm sorry, medications <laughs> would not feel quite right. They're going to feel kind of like lethargic, and so those medications throw everything off. So um, I'm like, why do you need these in the first place? So I said, go back to the doc and see if you can get your permission for me to talk to the doctor and just to see if we can't work together to change her diet more and see if she really needs to be on eight different drugs, which gives so many different reactions. Who knows what's causing what? Very good. Uh Uh-oh, we better go to Facebook where Lou Pop uh, uh, indicates, is it, or asks, is it true that following the keto diet can lead to heart issues? Can the keto diet impact muscle function? Yes. Yeah. I've done a video on that. It can greatly, greatly improve heart function. It can help your cardiovascular system greatly. Um, because all, because the alternative is the, you know, a lot more carbs and, um, uh, carbs are really underneath, uh, problems in the arteries uh, with heart issues and creating deficiencies. So yeah, they can definitely improve uh, your heart cardiovascular function. There was a, there was a study uh, uh, that said the, uh, that, oh yeah, keto is really bad for your heart. And then you, then you actually read the study, right? And you find out it involved mice and you find out um, they use a high fat diet, but they also use the high fat, high carb diet. So it wasn't keto. Sometimes people think a high fat diet is a keto diet. It's not. So anyone who says that, I always ask, who told you that? Where did you read it? Did you actually see the article? No. Okay. Well, there's definitely uh, a push to get people away from keto. Uh, But I think, um, I think the best way if you're confused is to try keto for a little while and then go back to your old diet and see which way you feel better on. And then, then you'll know. So that way you don't have to take my word for it. Yep. That's proof, proof positive. Okay. We've got uh, the audience right on it after a month uh, out of school. And the question asked, what is the most common nutrient deficiency that keep you tired? I'm dying to know this, although I belted down some coffee already. And uh, 40% of our respondents say it's vitamin D, 30% say uh, vitamin uh, B, 20% say potassium, and the final 10% say magnesium. Any winners? Okay, so the ones that said B vitamins, they're, they're, they're pretty close. It's actually B1. B1 is the spark plug to converting food, carbs, proteins, and fats into energy in the little energy factory, the mitochondria. So uh, it's a spark plug, and um, a lot of people are deficient, and it's a critical uh, nutrient for, um, for generating energy. And that's not there. I don't care what you do, what you eat. It's not going to work. You're not going to generate energy. But I'm not just talking about feeling fatigue and getting energy from that. I'm talking about the energy that's needed to power the heart, the brain, and especially the nervous system. And so, as you may already know, Steve, the... Uh, that real key part of the nervous system is called the, um, the autonomic nervous system where you have the flight or fight uh, system. And um, without enough B vitamin, what happens, B1 specifically, you get stuck in the flight mode or fight mode. And you're kind of uh, very reactive on edge. You can fly off the handle easily. Um, you don't tolerate stress. So babysitting, a lot of small kids over eight hours in a small room, poorly ventilated, would be very stressful to you. Um, driving, getting stuck in traffic for over three hours could be very stressful to you. So all these things could build up and uh, increase their need for B1. The other thing too is that the question is, uh, can you get B1 from the diet? It's kind of difficult uh, if you're doing, you know, just like drinking a lot of coffee, for example, caffeine, tea, or red wine, all that, all those who are like anti-B1 and alcohol, like in general. So you'll actually, a lot of people are, are consuming maybe good foods, but they're consuming these other things that are depleting them, not knowing they're deficient in B1. And then all of a sudden they, 
their, their sleeping's not right. Uh, they get up, they feel dizzy. Um, their pulse rate goes up. All these kind of really strange symptoms occur and they're not connecting the dots. So stay tuned for a video that I will release on that coming up in about a week. I think it's a very valuable, important video on, on B1 deficiencies and um, how it can just restore your energy. Um, I have experience, Steve. I'm an expert. I, was, uh, I had fatigue for 20 years. Goodness. Well, thanks for your exhaustive research on that, pardon the pun. And let's see. Uh, oh, by the way, folks, um, Dr. Berg's app, and I'm sorry I don't have a little logo up yet, but Dr. Berg's uh, app is a great resource to find in order all of his various videos. And you can get that on Android or Apple. So just go there, Dr. Berg app, and it'll be easy to find. In addition to, of course, Dr. Berg com, which you all are probably watching uh, the show through and so on. So don't forget to find those resources. But as Dr. Berg has mentioned before, sometimes it's a little difficult to search on YouTube uh, to find a video you want, but they've all been greatly, uh, perfectly categorized in the Dr. Berg app. So go there now, but don't tune us out. Stay tuned. In addition yeah. to, um, in addition to Lupak from Facebook, who uh, asked about keto, here's the folks that are listening to us around the world, including Europe, uh, where you just hints you came from. Let's see, a good morning to our viewers uh, from the UK, Canada, Colombia, Croatia, uh, Switzerland, Ghana, Italy, Denmark, India, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, South Africa, Romania, Georgia, Austria, France, the Czech Republic, uh, Zanzibar, Jamaica, Trinidad, Tobago, uh, Armenia, the Philippines. Thank you. We had one of our guests from there, Mr. McKay. Uh, uh, Papua New, New Guinea, the Netherlands, Pakistan, Australia, Ireland, Nigeria, Japan, Turkey, the Dominican Republic, Roland, Thailand, uh, Poland, excuse me, Thailand, Pakistan, Mexico, Chile, Peru, Belgium, what a list, Greece, Qatar, Germany, Bermuda, Ethiopia, Egypt, uh, Bahrain, and all across these United States. And we have a gentleman from Kosovo coming in this morning. Uh, Dyar, I believe, is his name. And Dyar, I want you to unmute yourself and give it to us straight from Kosovo. You're on with Dr. Berg. Yes. Yes. Hello. I'm from Kosovo. Nice talking to you, Dr. Berg. Uh, so can I make the question or wait? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, my, my question was simple. I just wanted to make sure because, uh, you know, a doctor from Kosovo said to me that uh, you have a little dandruff, you know, dandruff. Mm -hmm. So she told me to use uh, Caterol shampoo and uh, this shampoo, mm -hmm. if you can see. Uh, wait. There you go. It's called yeah. Vichy. I okay. think you know it. So I was scared to use them because I watch your videos and you said that uh, you don't have to use shampoos with uh, mm -hmm. selenium uh, you know that the one way selenium yeah. sulfate you know yes that's right so uh, uh before before this shampoo before which is shampoo i used head and shoulders but my hair hair keep like you know hurt or it was like an itchy skin so mm -hmm. that's why i went to the doctor and she said to use this vichy I think it's better than head and shoulders because my hair is n no more itchy and that things. But, you know, I'm still afraid because you said that you don't have to use with selenium. Well, here, here's just my viewpoint. And I'm glad you brought this up because uh, I think the, the thing that I'm just, you know, looking at is what's causing the problem in the first place, right? You get rid of this, the indicator, the symptom, and then, um, same, same thing with, uh, we just talked about B1 with uh, energy. You, if you have fatigue, you can drink coffee and get your energy back. But why are you tired in the first place? Why do you have psoriasis in the first place? Um, it's been highly correlated with uh, low vitamin D levels. So you might want to start taking that. And let's say, for example, you take vitamin D. Um, and most people take like maybe, <laughs> you know, 1,000 milligrams or 2,000 milligrams. And they think, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm good. But there's so many other things that can decrease the absorption of that vitamin D, like even genetic uh, yes. weaknesses. Um, I recently did a genetic test and I found my own weaknesses. And, and then also I had someone else to take it and they found they had uh, a defect in their vitamin D receptor, which means 
the normal amounts are not going to even touch the vitamin D deficiency. So they had to take like 30 or 40,000 I used to make the, make the connection. Um, so these are just things I would, I would watch the video, apply it, but the, the shampoos are working on it topically. They're not looking at the whole picture of, of why you have it in the first place. Um, there's a microbe involved too. You have uh, microbes that live on the scalp. So you should be, um, you know, watch my video on reestablishing the, the flora on your skin and mm -hmm. make sure you're not uh, having like fluoride or cl too much chloride in your, um, your water supply when you take a shower. So if you get a filter that filters that stuff out, it can help you greatly. So, you know, even women that use a lot of the hair dyes, unfortunately that it's so toxic to the microbes mm -hmm. and then you kill those off and then you get rashes and, uh, all sorts of issues that can happen with the scalp and your skin. So uh, keep watching the videos and um, she apply that. She also she also said to take uh, vitamin B six. You know, one one hundred milligram per day. Yeah, B six is probably not going to uh, be the big one. Um, it's kind of a a catch all thing that can help you to some degree, but it's not the 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 real dramatic you know effect that I think you'll get. B yeah, uh, six. No, my my question was uh, which which shampoo would you recommend me? I, I would recommend the one that's least toxic, and uh, I would have to kind of research both of those and see what you're taking. But uh, um, I couldn't really tell you exactly without looking at the ingredients and everything. And so uh, I would just watch my video on that, and um, also watch my video on on. Um, on some of the shampoos, I have videos on that and, and what it can do to your hair. And then you'll get more information. Dyer, thanks so much for participating with us. I really appreciate it. We'll have to move along now. And in fact, we're okay. going to we're going to go on to our next question. Uh, sure. Let's see. And that one I've already asked. Uh, and Dyer, if you're talking with us, so we have you muted to the audience so we couldn't hear that. But I'm sure you got some counsel from Dr. Berg. And here we go. A true falser. Okay, so true or false? Benign tumors are a form of cancer. Is that true or is that false? All right, dig into that, folks, and let's see. Uh, how about another question from YouTube? Oliver from YouTube, are pumpkin seeds good to consume since they contain a lot of omega-3s? Do they? Well, they can, no, I wouldn't say a lot. They can, they contain something called ALA, which is a precursor. It's a building block to the active form, but it's not an active form of the one that you need the omega-3. So, um, no, they're not going to give you a good supply, but they, but they apparently are good for prostate, you know, so maybe that can help you. Um, and so it's, you know, I would roast them and consume them that way, especially since it's, uh, you know, a lot of people are, you know, have their pumpkins outside right now. Might as well eat the seeds and you can dry them out, put some nice sea salt on it. I think that would be a good, good thing to take. Um, but yeah, so uh, I, they don't have a lot of omega-3. They just have the precursor, a little bit of the precursor, just like walnuts. Walnuts are great um, for many reasons, and they have the precursor uh, to the omega-3. And one. out of all the nut, I think the walnut would be one of the best nuts out there. And then the pecan would be next one after that. Wow, very delicious. Okay, uh, she hasn't given us uh, much information, but Caitlin from YouTube, poor thing, wakes up nauseous and gagging. Could this be a nutritional deficiency of some kind? I don't know if she's pregnant or what the problem, but is there a general cause for nausea and gagging? Yeah, yeah. Um, pregnancy, no. Um I think what's happening is um, that's usually a B1 deficiency. It's, if you feel like uh, nauseous or you even feel like vomiting, that I would take some B1 right away. Um, B1 also works on the nervous system that connects to the digestive system. We also have, so anything nerve is like B, B1, including the vagus nerve, which happens to go through that area and innervate the stomach and the gallbladder and, in the large and small intestine. So I would take uh, B1 as the, as the antidote to that. And of course I would also look at what you're eating because I haven't, you know, I, it's hard to evaluate someone without getting more information. So it's like, well, my best guess, that's what I gave you. But 
if I could get a list of what you're eating, then I can really know, you know? So that's helpful. Yeah. Caitlin, uh, make sure you write, uh, Dr. Berg, Dr. Berg at drberg.com. Is that right? Doc, did I get the email right? Um, Dr. Berg at drberg.com. Yeah. Very good. Caitlin, let us uh, have a few more details and I'm sure he'll try to get to the bottom of that with you. And speaking of getting to the bottom uh, of something, the true false uh, question has already gotten some answers, which asks true false benign tumors are a form of cancer and, uh, Interestingly, 65% of our respondents, oh, I'm sorry, 65% say it's false, which I would agree with. 35% say it's true, but who cares what I say? What's right, Doc? Yeah, it's it's false. So, yeah, uh, when you have a, a benign tumor, it's not cancer. Cancer is when it becomes malignant and it can spread. So a benign tumor, whether it's a polyp or even a skin tag, okay, those are benign tumors, um, they're not going to keep growing and take over the body and they're, they're not considered cancer. So, um, I'm going to release another video next week, um, on the skin tag simply because, um, you know, they're a really good indicator or like a little, um, gives you a little red light indicator that there's something deeper in the body, usually insulin resistance. And so, yeah, there's, it's really simple to get rid of skin tags, and I'm going to show you how to do it. But then you also have to fix the real problem underneath the whole thing. And I think, unfortunately, our society is doesn't look at cause-effect relationship. Um, you really have to think like an engineer to be able to think of cause and effect because um, uh, in the medical profession, they don't, they don't do that. It's all about the suppression of symptoms using medication. And... Um, so, but that's about it. So thus the videos that I'm trying to do to help people. And apparently there's a lot of people interested in uh, alternative method simply because I just last week, I counted up how many subscribers we have on all the languages of this YouTube channel. There's 18 million subscribers. So I was shocked and um, amazed and um, blown away that um, there's such a great interest in alternative you know, things to medicine. So I'm really happy that people are finding the channel and subscribing. No kid, what amazing numbers. Now, speaking of amazing, uh, next up, we've got Mr. Cruz Hill, and he didn't think he was going to get some good ratings without uh, bringing his beautiful wife on. So she is also in the scene. Go ahead. You can lean in there, Ms. Hill, and uh, let's see what they have to say. Cruz, you're on with Dr. Berg. Go ahead, sir. Hello there, Dr. Berg. Thank you for your time. I, uh, so I've been following you for, oh, you're muted, uh, quite, quite some years now. Okay. Now I can hear you. Really? Can you hear us now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. I've been following. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you for your time. Yeah. I've been following you for, for quite some time now. And, um, my main issue right now is I've been doing the keto diet for three months. I do think that I'm finally in ketosis, mm -hmm. but it was up to just, it, it, my body was just fighting me to get into ketosis. And I know I had a few medicines that they were in the mix. They were probably culprits. Right now I'm on the metformin. I'm type 2 diabetic. And uh, also Lyrica. I, I recently got rid of Lyrica. And, and it seemed like my body went into ketosis. But my sugar still seemed like they want to fight me a little bit. Not as bad. Good. They're not 300. That's good. Um, what What is your blood sugar recently? So, like this morning, it, it's been an average, like right now it's 115. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's 115. But, right. I but, agree. But in the past, whenever I was in ketosis, it would always, I remember it always being between 85 and 95, somewhere around there. And, and, it, and it's gone there. It's gone down to about 95. You know, it fluctuates, but yeah. it's a lot better. It was fighting me quite a bit. Even though I was doing keto, it would still go up to like um, um, 150. And that was with me not having no carbs. I mean, hardcore keto. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, Sorry. I guess my question was, I'm still on the meth. I'm on the metformin. Yeah. Uh, should I stop taking the metformin? 
Yeah, good question. Of course, I I can't tell you not to, I can't tell you to stop taking it, but I'm just going to give you information, okay, that you can determine. Um, <clears throat> metformin um, does help the insulin resistance problem because it makes the cells more sensitive and that's that's probably helping you in one way but there are some side effects that's why it has a black label on it so you know lactic acidosis that's what i don't like about it it also depletes your b1 and b12 so i don't like that um so here's the thing um the reason why you're uh you eat no sugar and your blood sugars are even they're are higher than they should be is because of the insulin resistance and that causes your liver to make new sugar, it's called gluconeogenesis, from <laughs> fat, protein, and even ketones. So it's, it's not coming from your diet, it's just coming because you have, you have a chronic blood sugar problem from the past that's gonna take a while to get you to a point where your insulin resistance is in check, and now you have normal blood sugar. So, so many people that uh, do this, they might end up with like, why are my blood sugars high? I'm not eating any sugar. Well, that's because you have insulin resistance for so long. It's going to take a while for your body to adapt. So I would just maintain what you're doing, make sure it's clean for some weeks longer, maybe a few more months. And then you'll see the blood sugar will come down to like 80 or even 70. And then, you know, your insulin resistance is a lot better. There are a lot of other things you can do to speed up the process, like apple cider vinegar, before bed, you know, in some, in some water. You can also take berberine, awesome, awesome stuff. You can take vitamin D, and you definitely could take B1, a natural B1, which, um, by the way, will, will kind of also counter what that medication is doing right now. So, and then as the blood sugars come down, get okay. with your doctor to, to decrease the amount of it, and that, because you, you know, you won't need it, you know, over, over a period of time. So I, I like what you're doing. You just have to realize that that's normal and it's going to take some more time. Can I ask a quick question as well? Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, your thoughts. Thank you. Your thoughts. I know that you can't direct me in any way medically, but I want your thoughts. So I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I am BRCA positive. Um, I've since had surgery, took it out. It was minuscule amount in the lymph nodes. Supposedly my margins, which equals slight margin, was not clear. I do not want to take any forms of radiation, chemotherapy. I want to do alternative. What are your thoughts on um, B17 or anything else that you, and you don't have to go into detail. You can just name things. I've researched quite a bit but I have yeah. access to B17, um, the actual apricot trees. What are your thoughts yeah. on that or peroxide on the skin or yeah. ingesting? Yeah, Laetrile. I mean, like, it's interesting. It's like if, if I put a video out on B17, they will shut my channel down. So it's a highly sensitive topic. So what I'm going to just tell you, um, and right. the same thing with hydrogen peroxide, if you take, if well, topically, but if you tell someone to take it orally, like, boom. Not a good thing. But here's the thing. Um, I would uh, watch all my cancer videos, uh, and I would uh, definitely apply uh, a lot of fasting as the primary thing. And I'm talking about regular intermittent fasting, okay. like definitely one meal a day. And then you got you have to start extending that to, like even on the weekends, do a 48-hour fast. And then maybe once a month you do even a four- or five-day fast. And the reason for that, it's going to strengthen your immune system, it is the, the, uh, the key most important thing to turn things around for you. Um, and then on top of that, there's a protocol. We, we did research. Uh, yes, it was on mice, but it was based on a very sound uh, theory that uh, seems to look very promising uh, by using certain remedies to inhibit this thing called SCOT, which is a strategy to um, not just start, not necessarily starve the cancer off fuel-wise, but to starve the material for its membrane to build a membrane. So that way it doesn't, it can't, if it can't do that, it can't survive. And we did, you know, I invested a good amount of what money. What is it that you said? It's called the Scott inhibitors, but it's a, it's a video. Um, if you look for my video on, on cancer, you'll find it. It's one of the ones that I said, I, I revealed the cancer uh, research, uh, the results. 
and you can and I and there's links to the protocol, and um, and none of those remedies uh, are any of my products. So I, I'm not. It's just something I would recommend finding on your own. But um, but what's interesting about this uh, cancer because I interviewed several people, and you should watch each of those interviews and what they did with stage four cancer. I'm talking like the worst, almost the worst case scenario where. Um, like even uh, one of the guys we interviewed, his name is Guy Tundelbaum. He went from stage four to zero cancer, right? And uh, he he just, and this has been several years right now. He's like cancer free. And uh, so the doctor, I says, I want the report. I want the report. And so the doctor finally gave us the report. I'm like, why could he not just put on there he's cancer free? And his reply was, the medical doctor's reply was, um, well, we like to, we can talk about cancer, but if you don't have cancer, we don't like to emphasize those 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 symptoms because you don't have it anymore. And I'm like, what? That's illogical. So he just couldn't come out and say he was cancer free, but he did say indirectly he was cancer free, all the indicators. But anyway, that's fine. But the point is that I would really emphasize more fasting. Now, you're probably in a situation where you wouldn't necessarily have to do the extreme fasting, like if you had some malignancy that was spreading through the through the body, in which case you would want to fast for like, you know, a month. But um, but I would definitely do at least periodic prolonged fasting to help yourself. And I think that you'll you'd be put in good shape. And then if it was of the cancer of the breast, you want to be taking um, C kelp on a regular basis as well, because uh, that has a good amount of iodine that can help regulate your estrogen and uh, keep it and also cruciferous cruciferous uh, foods so those are the two things i would i would recommend all right hill okay. family and thank, thank you. i'm sorry go ahead oh i was just gonna say thank you i'm also on the keto diet so i appreciate your input that is terrific Great. and awesome. just one more just one more question. I'm sorry. It was, it was the very question quickly. that I was supposed to ask you, and it was a very quickly. Basal insulin, can can I still be in ketosis and use a, a small amount of basal insulin? Because I kind of, I stopped it cold turkey. Mm. Well, uh, that, that'll, that'll bump you out of ketosis for sure. Um, so I can't tell you not to take it, but the thing is, like, the whole goal of keto is to reestablish the health of your insulin, right? And uh, what triggers insulin is carbs. So if you're taking the insulin to regulate the blood sugars, um, you kind of go in the opposite direction. But I'm not telling you not to take it, but I would just learn more about it so you can decide on your own. But, um, I mean, you're taking metformin and insulin. I mean, like, or now you took you came off of it. And if your blood sugars came down to 118, I mean, that's significant. The question is, do you really need that sludge hammer of a tool to get your blood sugars down because that's like that's the most potent thing you can do to drop blood sugars so anyway that's my thought all right folks well listen thanks so much for the hill family and we uh you know wish you all the well and hope that you uh keep us posted on your various uh health benefits uh doing a nice healthy lifestyle so let's go to the next question and then we're going to hit social media hard and make sure that we get some questions out there Okay, here's the next question for you, sir. Okay. All right. What is the common denominator between the plaque on your teeth and the plaque in your arteries? All right, audience, climb on that. And uh, let's see, uh, speaking of the audience, we're going to go to YouTube. Steven wants to know what the best time of day is to take berberine. Well, I think... Um, I would take it um, whenever you want your blood sugar, if whenever your wherever your blood sugars are the highest. So if you have like the dawn phenomena where you wake up in the morning, your blood sugars are high, take it first thing in the morning. Um, if it happens in the afternoon, take it maybe an hour before that. So anytime you want to keep the blood sugars low, because ber berberine is a very powerful, I mean, it, it kind of compares to metformin, like a natural version of metformin um, without the side effects. So... All right, very good. Let's see. Uh, Terry, help me with this. MCTN, MC maybe from Facebook. If you're a type 1 diabetic, how would you do intermittent fasting? You should definitely watch my recent video on type 1 diabetes. And I interviewed 
Manuel. And Steve, you know Manuel. I do. Um, he's a type 1 diabetic, and I uh, worked with him a little bit. And, oh, my goodness, he's the amount of insulin that he needs now is so tiny. And he's doing great. And he's doing, uh, if I'm not mistaken, one meal a day. And he's exercising like crazy. He's getting fit. He feels better. Um, it's a miracle. So um, the thing is that you want, you know, as a diabetic type one, you know, you need to take insulin. But the question is, how much do you really need to take? Um, take the least amount possible that you need to establish good blood sugars. And then you're, because that extra insulin creates problems, big problems, um, side effects. Uh, and if you don't believe me, look up um, uh, hyperinsulinemia and you will learn all about that. Well, Manuel, that is such exciting news. We all love him. He's a big part of the behind the scenes of the show. And uh, so thumbs up to uh, following Dr. Berg's counsel. And it sounds like it's going well. Betty Sue from Facebook. My electrolytes are always below normal and my blood pressure is high. My adrenals have been tested as normal. I can't find a root cause. Any thoughts? Um, yeah, if you if you're not retaining these uh, electrolytes, I mean, uh, I mean, the question I have is, is there a problem with the kidney or maybe there's a problem with your stomach, your pH in your stomach is not acid enough. If the stomach doesn't have a, enough acid and it's between one and three, it's it's really hard to absorb these minerals. So they kind of they don't get absorbed. And so here you are like it's kind of going right through you. Uh, so that's one one factor. Also, the absorption could um, could be inhibited by a problem in your gut. And um, so, my other question is, why do you think you're deficient in electrolytes in the first place? Is this based on a blood test or some symptom? And and I would need to ask the question. So that's as far as I can go without trying to go back and forth with you. But very good. Okay, no. The, 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 the two key electrolytes, like potassium and magnesium. Um, you can't really get a good picture of what's going on in your blood because 98% of those minerals are inside the cell. So you're going to have to do like an intracellular test and that requires a whole different thing. So that's, that's what I'd be curious about. Did you do that test? Did that show up uh, low? And, and let's say it did. And that's what you're talking about. Realize that it takes, it could take weeks or months to get those levels back to where they normally should be. Sometimes you think like, oh, I can do it in a day. No, it takes a period of time to reestablish uh, nutrient deficiencies. Even B1, it could take months. If you're very, very deficient, you'll feel better in the process, but it could take a long time. All right. Uh, Amy from Facebook, can you suggest any help for fibromyalgia? Ouch. Well, I would, I would go right to B1, first of all because um, that's, that's one common thing is you're going to generate too much lactic acid if you don't have B1, and that can create symptoms of fibromyalgia. There's, another, there's other two things that come to mind. One is it's not really fibromyalgia. It's a gallbladder problem, and the, the, the bile ducts are jammed up, and it's backing up pressure into the right side, causing fibromyalgia mainly on the right side of your body. So if it's just on the right side of your body, assume it's problems with your bile ducts, and I have a lot of videos on that. The remedy would be tutka. It's a simple uh, solution. And then the last uh, possibility could be um, uh, a low-grade um, kind of a systemic infection of either chronic uh, um, Epstein-Barr virus or a cytomegalovirus or some type of virus that's in the body that kind of goes in and out of remission. It's kind of a latent virus that comes out when you're under stress, and that can keep keep your body achy, inflamed, and tired. In which case, you have to deal with the stress that's activating it because the stress paralyzes the immune system to allow these viruses to come out of remission. It's always the stress. And so some people just have to figure out how to get rid of that stress because um, under that stress, it's, you know, if you're in a situation, I don't care what you take nutritionally, that stress is going to keep you in that mode because it keeps the virus kind of free floating, doing damage. Interesting. Okay. Here's some, uh, uh, fun stuff from, uh, Facebook. Noreen from Facebook wants to thank you for all your videos. I love them. And thank you from your followers in Ireland. So thank you, Noreen for checking in with us. And then here's another great one. 
Kara from Facebook, I have lost 80 pounds doing your healthy keto and IF. Thank you so much, Dr. Berg. What a great note that is. That's awesome. All right, let's go to another question. Yeah, I want to go I, someday. I want to go to Ireland. I've never been, but I, um, I think that's where they uh, create the Kerry Gold butter, which I, I like so much. So uh, I would love to go check that out. Yum. All right, Dr. Berg, another question. All right, what is the common denominator between plaque? Okay, well, we already did that one, but do you have the answer to that? Oh, I'm sorry. That's what it was about. Thank you for keeping me on track. All right. The question was, what is the common denominator between the plaque on your teeth and the plaque in your arteries? And the astute audience, 70% of them say calcium or calcification. 20% say sugars or high carb levels. And the last 10% say bacteria or biofilm. Sounds like someone's been studying. Mm, yeah. The answer is biofilms. Now, what are, what are biofilms? Uh, they're they're uh, uh, kind of a collection group of a uh, colony of microbes that band together that then form a slime shell and then a calcium shell. 95% of all the bacteria in the environment is living in biofilms. So even if you walk through a stream and uh, reach down and feel like these rocks, they have this slippery, that's biofilms. So the biofilms also can get can grow in excess and form tartar in your teeth as well as the calcium in your arteries, the calcium placking in the arteries. They found biofilms behind that, which is fascinating. So the question is, what can you do to get rid of these biofilms? Well, in the arteries, um, they tend to uh, get stuck on uh, surfaces that are not smooth. So what would create an unsmooth area in your arteries would be some type of damage, inflammation, uh, usually from sugar and refined carbs, right? Or omega-3 oils. That could do it. And so that way, these microbes don't have a chance to accumulate and uh, develop these barnacle-type things. In fact, um, if, you, if you take a look, one problem with sailors is these barnacles on the, on their, the bottom of their boats because they weigh things down and the, they require more fuel because you have all these huge calcium uh, shells that develop in these organisms that grow... The, and they use uh, different paints, um, toxic paints, to try to kill them because it's a big problem. But um, believe it or not, um, one sailor in, I think, 1990 came up with this great idea as he was eating a sandwich with uh, these hot, hot sauce. And he had this idea. He said, I wonder if we, we put hot sauce or hot peppers on these barnacles underneath the ship. And voila, it works. So he developed this paint, paint with these peppers. And... Apparently, it's not just the, uh, the pepper chemical, but it's the vitamin C, vitamin C that kills the biofilms. So um, I will be releasing a video on that topic. You could use even ascorbic acid, if it's non-GMO, in your mouth as kind of a mouthwash to kind of kill this tartar in your teeth. And of course, it also helps the arteries as well. So um, vitamin C is a good thing to inhibit the formation of the biofilms to your body. Okay, very good. We're going to go to another person in our green room, uh, Susan. But first, let's get another question out of the way. Here it is, Dr. Berg. Okay, true or false? GERD, heartburn, and acid reflux are, are the result of too much acid production. Is that true or false? All right, very good. Uh, jump on that. And folks, and Susan, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're on low on time, so if you can give us one quick question for Dr. Berg, we would appreciate it. You are on the air with Dr. Berg, Susan. Great. I uh, have been doing this uh, intermittent fasting and cider vinegar and everything for six months now. And um, when I went to my doctor to get checkups, I'm taking quite a few of the supplements that you uh, create also, um, my cholesterol levels are 242. And so the doctor gives me this routine about, you know, going on a low fat diet and all those things, which of course is actually opposite to what's happening. And the other number that's off that I'm not sure about is the 172.8 for my vitamin D3. And she says that's uh, toxic. You know, I shouldn't be taking, I should go off the thing and um, uh, stop it for five or six months. I'm taking your K2 and um, uh, B, uh, you know, I'm K taking your supplement. 
So because I believe from watching your videos that I had a uh, liver issue and maybe even bile and gallbladder. So I've been taking a bunch of your supplements to kind of get my body back in shape. I never needed to lose weight. It's just the intermittent fasting is wonderful. So I just wanted some insight into those numbers, which they say, the traditionalists mm-hmm. say, are dangerous. And I don't feel, I feel wonderful. So what, what should, you know, should um, I cool it a bit on the vitamin D? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe this is what I would recommend. There's a great new video, a recent video that I did put out on the toxicity of vitamin D. You should watch that if you haven't already, but I go into how much D is really toxic and how much you can tolerate before there's a problem. And, and even the problem would be the biggest problem would be kidney stones in which you could solve by just taking 2.5 liters of fluid a day, you know, that, that would just take you out of that risk factor, but you should watch that video uh, that I did recently, probably at least I think it's been maybe somewhere in the last three weeks. So that's one thing. Yes, um, I, and then I, I, maybe I, did, just, I did watch the video I did watch the video. It's just about the numbers that the doctors make you scared because they say, yeah. oh, it's too high. Is yeah. 172.8 too high or is it okay? There's two types of values. There's uh, one type of value in, in Europe and there's one in America. And so um, personally, I, I I can't. Here's the problem. If I start getting involved with uh, too many disagreements with your doctor, mm-hmm. I'm going to get in trouble. So I'm just going to say... <laughs> that um, <laughs> I would like you to look up the normal ranges and then just determine for yourself um, so I don't create a, another situation. But here's the thing that I would think with, um, you know, vitamin D is made from cholesterol, right? So let's say you went down to um, one of the tablets a day, which is 10,000 I use, which is a great maintenance dose. Um, that's right. not toxic at all. Right. And so um, the other thing too okay. is that... Um, Cholesterol, total cholesterol is really uh, kind of a false thing because when you're measuring total cholesterol, you're really measuring um, the, the, mainly the two lipoproteins, which is LDL and HDL. And so you didn't mention anything about those two, but um, let's say your LDL was high. Um, 177. Not, so it is high. 177. The LDL or total cholesterol? The total cholesterol the, or LDL? No, the LDL is the LDL. Okay. okay, good. Got it. So this is what I would highly recommend you do. And, and your doctor might not even do it. So you got to find someone to, to do an advanced lipid profile to look at. There's two different types of LDL. One would be the um, small, dense lipo, uh, small dense particle size, and the other one would be the large buoyant. And you just have to look at which one you have high. And I would bet you anything. It, it's going to be the large buoyant one, which are yeah. non-pathogenic. It's not going to be the small dense one. In which case, um, even my wife, Karen, she we her, her LDL was high. We found that. We did the advanced lipid profile. It's totally within the normal range because in a ketogenic diet, you are eating more fat. You are losing more fat. And with that comes more fat mobilization. And so there's no way around it. It has to come out of your body somehow. Um, you can always assist it by taking more bile salts by the gallbladder formula or maybe tutka. But um, right. this question keeps coming up over and over and over. And I, I have to keep kind of emphasizing, um, you know, you can't just go by the LDL. It doesn't really give you the full picture. Very so. good. Well, folks, we're, the fact okay, that you're, you're feeling so much better. You're welcome. The fact that you're doing so yeah. much better, it's like, I mean, I've had, doctors even take one step more and say, well, no, we need to put you on statins now. And all of a sudden the person just goes from feeling great down to, and they're on a high carb diet, low fat diet. And they just, I'm like, okay, so this is mainly why I drink on the weekends and I'm being very sarcastic, (laughs) but sarcastic. I'm not, I don't drink on the weekends, (laughs) but it's frustrating. Well, thank you so much, Susan. We appreciate it. And of course, love to hear back from you as things develop and let's go real quickly uh, to Justin, who's in Redding, California. And Justin, we're almost out of time, but uh, make sure that you get on the air. You're on with Dr. Berg. Go ahead with your question. Uh, you're muted, sir. 
Hi, great to meet you. The reason uh, I was interested in talking to you is um, I've normally had uh, great blood pressure my whole life until last year, and uh, I'd gone to the doctor because I had this complaint where I was feeling lightheaded after I ate. And I, I talked to him, and he really mm. didn't have an answer for me. He said, it's probably something else. And he checked my blood pressure, and it was 180 over 100. And he put me on a variety of different drugs, tried a few different blood pressure meds. And uh, I wasn't feeling terribly well during that period. And uh, I immediately started looking for answers, found you, started working on a keto diet, um, went from 220 to about 197 now, uh, weight-wise. And... Um, uh, I'd heard that perhaps this was insulin related, perhaps, and um, it just uh, it, it blew me away that I'd gone from really good blood pressure to within six months terrible blood pressure, and uh, I'm still losing weight. But the you know part of the discovery process was I walked up the stairs and my heart was racing 150 beats a minute just out of nowhere and my whole body was shaking and I just felt absolutely terrible. And, um, and so I had several repeats. I'm on the treadmill seven days a day, a week for 30 minutes. And, um, it's started to recede and it's happening less frequently, but I just, I'd get hit with these sudden episodes of racing heart. And so I thought I'd ask you to see if you had any uh, input. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, you know, <clears throat> the most likely cause of the, the high blood pressure would be insulin because insulin makes the arter arteries thicker and uh, more rigid. But there's other causes too, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, low vitamin D levels can raise the blood pressure and um, also low potassium can also raise the blood pressure, which a lot of doctors are recommending more potassium nowadays because it softens up the arteries, it helps the kidney, and it helps to lower blood pressure, especially if they're trying to deal with the salt, right? So um, if you go too low on the salt, it throws everything off. So what you do to counter that is you increase the salt with the potassium at the right ratios, two to one, and then all of a sudden now you have the, the amount of blood that you need, so it's not a low volume, and then the heart doesn't have to compensate. So it sounds like there's something going on in that area, um, also, B1 deficiency uh, can create those same symptoms, especially as a co compensatory, like a heart thing, which is racing um, to compensate. Because out of all the areas of your body, you have the most mitochondria inside the heart. And so you need a lot of B to help the heart. So I would, I would try a couple things, but not all together, okay? I would, I would check your blood pressure uh, and your pulse rate um, several times a day, keeping a log. And for two days, I would, I would take like B1 and see if that doesn't handle it. And the next two days, I would take vitamin D. And the next two days, I would take more potassium to try to rule out what's going on. And then um, if that doesn't solve it, come back next week and because uh, there's some other things you can do as well. I, I, think, I think this is uh, related to one of those three things. So um, we'll just have to find out. Sounds great. Okay, Justin, listen, if you would, uh, send, you. send a note to uh, Dr. Berg at drberg.com so we can make sure we get you the link for next week or the week after if it takes you that long to complete your uh, experimentation because we would love to hear back from you and hope you can get those uh, kind of scary numbers uh, back in check. That's terrific. Uh, and thank you for participating, everyone in the green room. Like, like, like even tach like tachycardia, high pulse rate, um, if you're low in vitamin B1, which a lot of people are, and uh, especially if you start keto, right? And you, you, can act, you need more B1 because of the need for a higher amount of metabolism, burning more, a different type of fuel. So if you don't take that B1, what happens is that uh, um, the pulse rate can go up, the blood pressure can go up because it's compensating. It's a, you know, you can do a lot of testing to try to diagnose it, expensive, but it's very cheap to just go out and get some natural B1 to test the waters and like, wow, that helped me within a few days. So anyway, um, I'll have to put some more videos on, on that. I want to mention one, a couple things, Steve, uh, before we go. Number one, um, I completely redid uh, my keto and intermittent fasting membership site. For those of you that um, have used it before or are new to it, we completely redid it. Uh, it's awesome. And there's two versions. One is the do it yourself. The other is a coaching version, which we actually, you send in pictures of your meals and then we critique them until it's correct. So we want you to do it long enough. So it becomes a new habit. And, um, 
it's a basically we'll analyze your food, your meals. So we do have a, a version of that to help you with that. And uh, you just like send in exactly what you eat and, and do that long enough until you really understand uh, how to do this correctly and get the benefits. The key is doing it consistent, uh, doing, doing it correctly consistent enough because a lot of people do it incorrectly for a long period of time and it doesn't work. So we want to put you, get you on the right track. So we have that and um, the app and of course, and also, you know, we, we also are shipping our products overseas now to, to make it a little bit cheaper. We'll put some links down below. But on that note... Oh, by the way, um, Dr. Burke, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we do have the answers to our last question, which I didn't bring oh, up Oh, I forgot about that. That's all okay. right. So let's do it. And that question asks, true, false, GERD, heartburn, and acid reflux are a result of too much acid production. And 95% of our respondents say that's not true. 5% say it is true. Well, the, 90 per, the, the majority is, tr is, is the correct group because um, it's actually not an excess production of acid, it's the acid in the wrong place. The acid is in the esophagus and it shouldn't be there. So there's a highly sophisticated machine in your stomach where you have this acid that, that's in communication with the valve on the top of the stomach. And the way it works is when you, you need this strong acid, like you need that valve to shut when you digest, right? When you, especially if you're digesting meat and things, and so if you don't have enough acid, the valve's not going to shut. It comes right up into the esophagus, and that's where you get the, uh, the problems. And if you, you know, you look this up and look at what the cause of heartburn, GERD, acid reflux is, they'll say, oh, it's the valve not closing. Well, that doesn't tell us anything. Well, what do we do? If, what's the real cause? They don't get into that. And then they put you on medication or they might do surgery, which comes with a lot of side effects. So... Simple solution is to take more, um, if you have those problems, take apple cider vinegar. But you might say, well, what about, it's a different type of acid. It's not hydrochloric. Well, all we have to do is we have to drop the acidity level down to one to three to then activate this whole process from happening. So you can do it with different types of acid. It doesn't necessarily have to be hydrochloric. So anyway, on that note, um, stay tuned for regular Friday morning shows. Um, I'm not going anywhere for a while. So I uh, appreciate your wonderful attention and the wonderful comments, which I read almost all of your comments on my videos. So I appreciate that. And stay tuned for some great content. See you next week or actually tomorrow morning.